This is lesson 1913, The Reign of Terror. Why and how did the French Revolution take a radical turn entailing terror at home and war with European powers? It's a story we've already been telling. And we still got College Board Topic 5.4, The French Revolution, explained the context in which the European states experienced crisis and conflict from 1648 to 1815. After the execution of Louis XVI, the radical Jacobin Republic led by Robespierre responded to opposition at home and war abroad by instituting the Reign of Terror, fixing prices and wages, and pursuing a policy of dechristianization. And I've already talked about some of the problems I've got with this statement. Revolutionary armies raised by mass conscription sought to bring the changes initiated in France to the rest of Europe. And we've got College Board Topic 5.5, The French Revolution's Effects. Explain how the, the events and developments of the French Revolution influenced political and social ideas from 1648 to 1815. While many were inspired by the revolution's emphasis on equality and human rights, others condemned its violence and disregard for traditional authority. We've still got France. We've definitely got the guillotine. And the time frame is 1793 to 1794. Key concepts of the reign of terror. Well, we've got the reign of terror, of course. Another concept is the law of suspects. Another one is the general maximum. And of course, we've got the guillotine. Key people of the reign of terror, the Federalists. We started talking about them last time. And Jean-Paul Marat. We started talking about him as well. And we've got a new person, Charlotte Corday. We've also got Bertrand Barrere and the Committee of Public Safety. Who were these Federalists that we ended the last lesson with? The National Convention was shocked that they faced a new revolt on top of the Vendée and the seven foreign powers that were already at war with the Republic. These Federalists, they weren't royalists or supporters of the church like the fighters in the Vendée. They weren't counter-revolutionaries. The Federalists believed in the Revolution and in the Republic, just like the people they were fighting. But they wanted a more moderate, more peaceful Republic than was constantly being stirred up by the radical thought, like what seemed to be coming from the Jacobins all the time. And they tended to be more modest merchants, artisans, and other middle-class members. And they wanted to see how the Republic would benefit the middle class rather than costing them like it always seemed to. The Federalists resented local Jacobins in their areas. Keep in mind that the Jacobin Club had branches all over France. And the Jacobins always seemed to flatter the masses, those who had nothing, to get them on their side. And the Jacobins always seemed to include a tax on men of property with their talk of equality. The Federalists mistrusted the crowd and they mistrusted the popular violence that it could produce. And they felt that the revolution had gone far enough, and they wanted to oust the Jacobins from their hold on local governments. But while the American Federalists that we study in American history, such as Alexander Hamilton and John Adams, believed in a strong central government, a French Federalist believed in just the opposite. They wanted more power to go to the local governments. They resented Paris with its radical opinions, and it's sans calling all the shots for all of France. When the large, moderate cities of France, like Lyon and Bordeaux, heard about the Girondin expulsion from the National Convention in Paris on June the 2nd, they refused to back the Jacobins. What was going on with the Girondin in Paris ran completely against what moderate Republicans were trying to accomplish in their own cities. The Federalist Revolt was different from the Vendée Revolt in two big ways. Number one, the Federalists couldn't raise a large army like the Catholic and Royal Army of the Vendée. And number two, the Federalists couldn't get the kind of local popular support that the Vendée Revolt had enjoyed. The Jacobin that the Federalists hated the most was the Montagnard, the mountain, Jean-Paul Marat. No surprise there. To the Federalists... Marat represented the violence and the anarchy that they hated so much. And they saw him as a menace that needed to be purged in order to save the Republic. The most famous of the Federalists was actually a 24-year-old woman of noble birth named Charlotte Corday. She lived in the moderate-sized town of Caen in Normandy. 
and she was inspired by the Federalist message. And in fact, she said at her trial, I was a Republican before there was even a revolution. She left calm, and she traveled alone to Paris in order to hunt down and kill Jean-Paul Marat. She didn't find him at the National Convention because Marat was working from home at this time. Jean-Paul Marat suffered a form of dermatitis which caused intense itching, and only hours in the bathtub could provide relief. So Corday found Marat's apartment and talked her way into his bathroom where he was in the tub. She claimed that she had information about Federalist conspirators in Normandy. And Marat and Corday talked for about 15 minutes. During the conversation, Marat remarked that the Republic would soon have the heads of all the conspirators in her home province of Normandy. As we've seen, Marat often wrote in such language. And that's when Charlotte Corday made the decision to plunge a knife into Marat's chest just below the collarbone. He died almost instantly after crying out to his wife for help. Charlotte Corday was arrested on the spot. The authorities were sure that there had to be a conspiracy behind her assassination of Marat. They interrogated her at length. At the end, they had to conclude that there was no conspiracy to be found. Charlotte Corday had acted completely alone. In jail, Corday wrote a letter to the French people in which she claimed it was her duty to kill Marat, who had already been judged, quote, by the universe. At her trial, she testified, I have killed one man in order to save a 100,000. Charlotte Corday was guillotined four days after killing Jean-Paul Marat. The people of Paris were furious and in grief that their watchdog had been murdered. They viewed Marat as a martyr who had died for the Republic. And Corday's executioner even picked up her severed head and slapped it in front of the spectators. The National Convention called upon staunch Jacobin Jacques-Louis David to paint the death of Marat that summer. Many people called for revenge for Marat's murder. They blamed Girondin leader Jacques-Pierre Brissot and the Girondins. Many Montagnards and other Jacobins also feared being targeted for assassination themselves. And as we've seen, the Federalist Revolt was very closely connected to the Girondin Purge. As a result of the assassination, French Republic troops lay siege to the Federalist-held city of Lyon and put it down. On August 18th, Federalist rebels actually gave the city of Toulon, with its entire naval base and most of France's Mediterranean fleet, to the British who occupied the city. The British had already been blockading the city at that time. On September the 5th, thousands of Parisians led by the sans culottes surrounded the National Convention and demanded two things. Number one, more controls on the price of bread. And number two, the total suppression of the counter-revolution throughout France. In other words, the people of Paris were demanding the terror. The reign of terror. We tend to think of the reign of terror in a kind of a tale of two cities kind of way. We view it as this time when France sunk into a dark abyss of paranoia, hatred, and insanity. Imaginary enemies were seen everywhere, and the guillotine could kill anyone without rhyme or reason, and anyone could be next. And there was no government, no law, no authority, and the rest of the world could just watch in horror and helplessness. Its most recognizable icon was the guillotine. But even the guillotine had two powerful pieces of enlightenment thinking behind it. It was considered the most humane form of execution. It was gruesome, but at least it was over in an instant and painless. Other forms of execution could be agonizing and long. It was also egalitarian. Everyone died the exact same way. It didn't matter whether you were the highest emperor or the lowliest serf. One of the perceptions that we have of the reign of terror was that the guillotine was popular entertainment. However, people found it so distasteful after a while that the National Convention moved the executions to a spot in the outskirts of the city. There was much more to the reign of terror than just the guillotine. 
We can see how much pressure the New Republic was under. The war was going badly, the treachery of leaders like the deceased Mirabeau and the defect de Maurier, economic crisis, especially the ever-present price of bread, counter-revolutionaries and revolts. When you're talking about the price of grain, by the way, it's a vortex of all kinds of other political and legal issues, hoarders and speculators who mess with the supply and the price, counter-revolutionaries who disrupt distribution, laws about economic policy, and what good is an entire government that can't figure out the most basic thing, how to feed people and keep them from starving. Something had to be done or the republic was going down. And that something had to be decisive, it had to be drastic, it had to be radically different from anything that had been attempted thus far. And that's when, on September the 5th, 1793, a member of the Saint Colot used the word terror in a petition. And that same day, a member of the National Convention and the Committee of Public Safety, Bertrand Barrer, responded to it in a speech. And he said this, the aristocrats of internal affairs are since many days meditating a movement. Oh, well, they'll have it, that movement. But they'll have it against them. It will be organized, regularized by a revolutionary army that at last will fulfill that great word that it owes to the Paris Commune. Let's make terror the order of the day. When Bertrand Barrère made this speech to the National Convention on September the 5th, the topic under discussion was actually the, the establishment of a paid force of 7,200 men to go out and crush the revolutionaries. Nobody was really thinking of the guillotine at that moment. So what do they mean by the word terror? How do they use that word? When we think of the word terror, we think of horrible things like cruelty and terrorists and horror movies and war criminals and atrocities. We don't normally associate terror with concepts like law or justice or quality. But when the revolutionaries used the word terror, they did. For them, terror meant the swift, forceful, and equal application of law and justice to those who deserved it. And it should make them afraid. These people need to know that we mean business and we're not messing around. The other way you can think of it is doing what you have to do, regardless of how difficult or distasteful it might be. But the use of the word terror grew into an appropriate term for forcing the people to comply with whatever laws and decrees the Republic needed to pass in order to address all of its very serious challenges. And the message was... The situation is dire, the Republic is hanging by a thread, and these measures are not optional for anyone. Keep in mind that a key principle of the reign of terror for the revolutionaries was its equality. Everyone, regardless of their station in life, would be treated with fairness and justice under the terror. And it would not matter whether that treatment was your punishment for insurrection or the price you had to pay for bread at the bakery. But here's how I describe the Reign of Terror. The Reign of Terror was a centralized, coordinated, last-ditch, all-hands-on-deck campaign by the Jacobin-led National Convention to pull the Republic from certain death at the hands of multiple national emergencies. And these emergencies included international war, civil war, political revolt, massive inflation, and food shortages. So what are some of the parts of doing what you have to do? Number one, suspend the brand new constitution of 1793 that's still sitting in that cedar box. Number two, the Committee of Public Safety would function as a war cabinet. Number three, use the full force of the law against traitors and enemies. Hence, the law of suspects. The law of suspects said this, every commune in France had to set up a surveillance committee and start arresting suspects. Anyone with ties to emigres or nobles, anyone who supported royalism or federalism, and anyone who acted as enemies of liberty. They also had to save the economy, hence the general maximum 
a maximum fixed price on 39 commodities, including bread, soap, leather, and iron. These price fixtures would help the poor survive, and they would also help the government afford to supply the army. They had to save the country from war, and they had to institute social programs. The Committee of Public Safety was to be the central coordinating authority which would direct the effort nationwide, and it was given five powers eventually. Oversee the armies, supervise the economy, mobilize manpower and supplies, suspend local elections, and appoint national agents to influence local politics. The Committee of Public Safety had 12 members. Maximilien Robespierre was just one member and not the leader. They were from a variety of backgrounds, including a minister and an actor, and they didn't always agree with each other. But Robespierre was its most vocal defender. Robespierre believed in doing whatever was necessary to protect liberty and the republic. Many Jacobins felt the exact same way. For perspective, France had already seen a huge amount of violence going on long before the Reign of Terror began. One of the Reign of Terror's first victims was Marie Antoinette. She was put on trial before the recently created Revolutionary Tribunal, which we talked about in the last lesson. She had 35 different charges against her. Many of the statements made by witnesses against her were repeated from scandalous lies made about her in the press. In the end, she was convicted of high treason, and she was guillotined the next day. Artist Jacques-Louis David made a sketch of Marie Antoinette as she was being carted to the guillotine. Then, 22 of those 29 purged Girondins were put on trial before the Revolutionary Tribunal. This included Girondin leader Jacques-Pierre Brissot. Many issues and events that had a circumstantial connection to the Girondin made these defendants look really bad. For example, the recent military losses of Girondin-affiliated military men, the Federalist Revolt against the Jacobins, they had also been unwilling to put the king to death. And the fact that the Federalists had given the Mediterranean naval base of Toulon made it look like the Girondins were colluding with the enemy. The Girondins defended their actions without success. They were all sentenced to death on October 30th, and after a last meal together that evening, they were all guillotined on October 31st. The victims of the Reign of Terror... Most of its victims lived in the province areas that were racked by civil war and counter-revolution. Very few of them were nobility, only about 8%. In all of France, 16,594 people were sentenced to death. Of those, only about 2,600 were in Paris. But about 35,000 died overall from various terror-related causes, like dying in prison, for example. About 75% of the executions took place in the Vendée and the areas of Federalist Revolt in other French cities. Many areas of France escaped the Reign of Terror almost entirely. 31 departments of the 83 had less than 10 executions total, and 6 departments had no executions. Deputies of the National Convention were sent out on mission in Paris to the provinces to help local authorities carry out the Committee of Public Safety's goals. Their efforts were coordinated from Paris by the Committee of Public Safety. They worked with local Jacobins, and their top priority was working with forced recruitment programs for the army. The army had 750,000 men by the end of 1793, so it was very successful. They mobilized the local economies for the combined effort of supporting the war and feeding the people. They instituted taxes on the richest citizens. They were not opposed to private property, but they did believe that wealth should be distributed more equally than it had been, as we've discussed. They built armament factories, not only for weapons, but to create jobs. They opened textile workshops to employ the poor and supply the armies with uniforms. Deputies on mission also helped local forces put down the revolts against the Republic. Many helped with the de-Christianization movement, 
and they often had the difficult job of mediating among local enemy factions. Some areas got especially brutal repression. The Federalist stronghold of Lyon saw 1,900 Federalists executed. In the city of Nantes, the deputies on mission there had 2,000 Vendée revolutionaries strapped to the decks of barges and drowned them in the river. One surprising part of the terror was social reform. And we don't normally associate terror with social reform, but the terror was also about preserving the republic. And the republic stood for individual rights, and the republic stood for equality. And even though the new constitution was suspended because of the national crisis, everyone still knew what it had in it. This was also something that the deputies on mission from Paris worked on diligently. And these efforts were directed and coordinated by the Committee of Public Safety in the exact same way as the war effort and the suppression of the Republic's enemies. The revolutionaries got rid of the last of the seigneurial dues during the terror. They abolished slavery abroad during the terror. They instituted family reforms such as equal inheritance during the reign of terror. They also promoted the new calendar and they closed down more churches. They instituted secular, free, public primary schools for both boys and girls in the middle of the terror. They fixed the widespread complaint among poor peasants that lands confiscated from the church and from the emigres were always being bought up by rich merchants. They corrected this simply by dividing these lands into smaller lots that the poor peasants could also afford. The peasants were allowed to vote on how to divide common lands among the villagers. They set up nationwide programs of state welfare and poor relief in the middle of the terror. And this included modest pensions for soldiers and widows and the elderly. One deputy put it this way, We must enable the poor to live if we want them to help us complete the revolution. <laughs> 